as we continue right down the road through our series in the Gospel of John entitled Living the Good Life, we are seeking to embrace Jesus and the life, the eternal life that he offers. And really, we've pointed out many, many times already that John's purpose for writing his gospel is to urge the reader to belief. That's the purpose. The purpose of the gospel of John, the main purpose, is to urge the readers of this gospel to belief in Jesus as the giver of eternal life. Two weeks ago, not last week because we had a missionary here, but two weeks ago when we were in this passage, we began to take a look at the events of John chapter 9, and we saw Jesus perform another miracle. Really, that, that's the platform that this gospel writer, John, uses to urge belief. He takes the miracles and actions of Jesus and says, See, look, this is the Savior. This is the one that you should be embracing for, yes, your salvation, and yes, your eternal life in this life, the eternal nature of life that you can have even right now. And what we see in, in this chapter is uh, some more examples and principles on what it looks like to take Jesus up on the contemporary aspect of eternal life. When I say contemporary aspect of eternal life, what I'm meaning by that is the eternal life that you and I, as believers, have the privilege to live right now. You see, eternal life is not something we wait till we get to heaven to live. If you know Christ, you experience eternal life now. And so, in chapter 9 of the Gospel of John, uh, I've highlighted about five principles of taking Jesus up on that offer of eternal life that we can live now in this life. And last week, we looked at two of them. I will go over them in review, and then next, uh, or the, the rest of this message today, we'll go over the other three. There are five imperatives here as, uh, as we go through this message entitled, Following Jesus 101. So we're really using a classroom type uh, illustration here. Um, five imperatives or five musts that help us to learn what it means to experience that eternal life right now. This world has a way of draining us. Our own emotions and our flesh have a way of draining and distracting us. There is so much in life that distracts us from the eternal life that Jesus offers us. And so I trust today that out of these five imperatives, you will find one of them to say, let me meditate on that. Let me, let me find a reason to, to, to take Jesus up on that life that, that he offers. All right, here we go. Last week, we, right, let's stop and pray. Can we do that? Let's pray and ask the Lord to remove all distraction, to, to quiet our minds and our hearts, uh, you might even find your phone and silence it. Everybody, we can all do that. Listen, there have been times when I've been preaching. Hey, I don't fault anybody for sounds that come from their phones because we, we often don't remember. But there have been times when I've been preaching and I've been like, you know what? I forgot to silence it and I'm so glad it didn't ring while I was preaching. So right now I'm checking my phone and making sure you can take yours out and make sure that it's silenced so that it doesn't distract you or anybody else, Okay. So here we go. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would quiet our minds and our hearts and help us to receive what your word is offering us today. I pray that you would help us to realize that the eternal aspect of life that Jesus offers is worth it. And Lord, it is so much more worth it than what this world offers. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to realize that eternal life is to be lived even right now in this life. And I pray that you would just, just give us grace as we receive your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The very first of those five imperatives that we looked at last week was this. We need to learn to trust God and not our own conclusions. I don't know about you. But I have a tendency to look to my own conclusions for direction in life. Oh, well, this person must be thinking this, so this is how I'm going to think about them. 
Oh, this person must have meant that, so this is how I'm going to interpret that. Oh, these set of circumstances in my life must mean X, Y, or Z. Must mean God is against me because this is, this is terrible, and, and this is how I'm going to interpret it. You know, we often jump to conclusions in life, but they are not always necessarily, maybe rarely, Bible-based, God-verified conclusions. You know what I mean? So like in this passage, there was a blind man, and we, I won't go back and read every verse, but in the first seven verses, there was this blind man, and Jesus' own follower said, hey, master, tell us, who sinned that this man is blind? Did he sin? Did his parents sin? Well, who, whose fault is it that the, this guy is blind? And do you remember Jesus' statement? He said, neither had this man sinned, nor his parents but, the work, the, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Jesus says, listen, don't jump to your own conclusions here. God had a plan in this trial, in this man's life, and it was that many would come to know Christ. In fact, Jesus goes on in the, the very next verse, or the verse after that, says, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And right after that statement, he spit on the ground, made a little clay, made a little mud. He put it on that man's eyes and told that man to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And that man was healed from his blindness miraculously. Now, the whole point of that is, and I draw your attention back to Jesus' statement, that the point of this man's blindness was that the works of God should be made manifest in him. God had a purpose to accomplish through the trial of this man's blindness. And my point here that I want to drive home to you is don't just assume you understand why something is happening in life. God may have a purpose and a plan that is much bigger than you could have ever imagined. This particular situation had eternal ramifications. There were people, and there are still people, whose lives were and are being eternally transformed because of this man's blindness. Still today, people are reading about this man, and their lives are turning to Christ and being changed for all of eternity. That's a big deal. I'm, I highly doubt this man, those around him, or his parents, or anyone else realized the magnitude and the, the, the hugeness of God's plan to use this trial. And so that just simply tells me, if God never changes, God could choose to use something going on in your life or my life to the extent and to the end purpose that we could have never imagined. You know what that encourages in you and in me? It encourages faith. It says, Lord, I don't understand all the details here, but what I do know is that you are bigger than my own understanding, and I'm going to trust you. And there were three conclusions we drew from all this. Remember, trials can be intense. I mean, come on, the guy was blind. I cannot for one minute begin to tell you that I understand what blindness is like. And most, if not all of you in this auditorium and, and, and by live stream, Probably can't identify with that either, but you can identify with intense trials. Every single one of us could come up with something that is going on or has gone on in our lives that is intense. Trials certainly can be intense, but trials also may or may not lessen or change. We drew that conclusion. You know, this, this man went on in blindness for a long, long time until this point in his life. They, trials may change, they may not change. And the third conclusion that we drew was this. Despite a trial's intensity or longevity, God can and should be trusted. Because he can see the bigger picture when we cannot. So my encouragement to you in this first imperative is to choose to rest in God's all-wise plan in you and through you even if you can't see the end result. All right, that was the first imperative. The second one, love to tell your story of Jesus' interaction. We saw this in verses 8 through 12, where basically the people who had known this guy before, that he was blind, they start talking like, who is this? This guy walking around seeing, is, isn't this the one who used to sit over here who was blind and begged? 
And some said, yeah, that's him. Others was like, oh, I don't know. He's kind of like him, but no, nah, that's not him. And do you remember what he said? He, this guy pipes up. He goes, yeah, I am him. I am that guy you're talking about. I am different. Something has changed. And they looked at him and they said, how are your eyes open? What happened to you, man? How did this come about? And he answered and said, a man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said unto me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. Then they said unto him, where is he? He said, I don't know. I know not. So what happens here is this guy is sharing his details of what happened when he met Jesus. Now, what we have the privilege of, and I pointed this out last time, what we have the privilege of is seeing this guy's story from the other side. We know that it was Jesus, the very Son of God, who touched him and healed him. At this point in the story, he didn't know that. He just knew this guy he met named Jesus healed him of his blindness, and I'm, I am absolutely certain this guy was amazed at that. You know, I mean, come on. If that happened to you, wouldn't you be amazed? Absolutely. But that's really where this stopped. What I wanted to point out here is that the details of his interaction with Jesus had everything to do with pointing others to Jesus, whether he realized it in that moment or not. You see, him describing what happened when he met Jesus had everything to do with pointing others to the truth of knowing who the Son of God is. He didn't know that at the time, but we know that. This was the active work of God in his life, and these were vitally important details. And what I, really what I wanted you to see here is that what Jesus has done to change your life is a set of details that are more than worthy to be shared with those that God has placed around you. When's the last time you shared your details of Jesus' interaction with those that God has placed around you? You see, some of us have details that nobody else can claim. Some of us have details of our own interaction with Jesus and the fact that he transformed our soul. Some of us have details that others could not ever have. Are you sharing them? They're share-worthy. You know, we, in, in, in the social media world, there's a concept called share. You know, you come across something that you like on social media. You're like, oh, I want to, I want to tell people about what I just read. And so you click the share button. And automatically what you just read goes out to however many people can see your social media feed. Well, you know, I think we need to be hitting the share button a lot more on the details of our Jesus interaction. When's the last time you hit the share button? Do you have to have a, a corporate event to go and be a part of evangelistically to share the gospel? Absolutely not. You have Jesus uh, opportunities, gospel opportunities around you every single day of your life. Are you taking advantage of those opportunities to share those details? The two conclusions we drew from that are regardless of your age, your background in sin, or even how long you've been saved now, your Jesus interaction details are worth sharing. And the other conclusion that we drew was this, that you do not need to wait for some sort of full preparation in order to share the gospel because your salvation story is filled already with gospel details. Just start sharing them. All right? So that's what we looked at last time. That was all review. Here we go. Let's get the last three points of this passage. The third imperative that we see in taking Jesus up on the offer of eternal life, even now in this life, is this. We need to look to face disagreement over Jesus. I'm going to read a, pass, a lengthy passage, okay? So far, I haven't had you really read a lot of the passage. So here I want you to put your seatbelt on, put your reading eyes on, and your thinking cap on. And let's read, starting in verse 13. Let's catch up where we are in the story. And I want you to see if you can recognize some of the disagreement that was starting to happen because of the truth of who Jesus is and what he had done. Here we go. Starting in verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him, 
how he had received his sight, he said unto them, He put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed, and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, Well, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They, said, they say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him? That he, uh, that he hath opened thine eyes. He said, he's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son who ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age. Ask him. He shall speak for himself. And these words spake his parents, because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Then again, they called the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them. Now I think this is the third time this guy is explaining what happened to him. He answered them, I told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? <laughs> this is almost comical. Will ye also be his disciples? You guys want to be his disciples too? I mean, is this why you're asking about him? Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now, we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God, and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. This is a quite, quite the little narrative here. This is quite the interaction. There are at least three groups of people here that, that we just read about, and subsequently at least three different responses to Jesus' actions. One group we see here is the Pharisees. These were angry, doubtful, and accusatory guys, religious guys, who had no intentions of humbling themselves to accept Jesus and his gospel. Then there was there, the, another group of people here is, is the, the parents of the healed man. No doubt they were absolutely relieved that their son, who struggled with this for years and years and years, was now healed. But they were fearful. They were fearful to give credit to this Jesus because it had already been known that the religious crowd was going to excommunicate you if you admitted that Jesus was God's anointed one to rescue mankind. So for fear of man, these, you remember the parents? They were like, oh, we don't know. Go ask him. They didn't want to implicate themselves in this whole Jesus matter. And then there is the third group, really it's just a person. That's the healed man. Now he was not yet still at this point in the story. But his language here reveals that his eye calls Jesus a prophet. And he's pinpointed by
Jesus had followers, I, I, I have to assume he see what maybe I need to be. truth of this whole matter. And then in verses 30 to 33, to wrap up, to sum up what he was saying, he basically says, now let's think about this for a minute, guys. What we have just witnessed in this man, can anyone but God do this? I believe his eyes were really, pardon the pun, were being opened to the truth of who Jesus is. There are three completely different responses here. And I think that's just really a snapshot of typical responses that people still today have toward Jesus in his gospel. Some people, they hate Jesus and the mention of Jesus and vehemently reject him. You know people like that. We see it all around us, both personally, on the TV screen, on the internet. We see it everywhere. That, that's no secret, and it's not new. It's been like that since Jesus has been around. There are some people who don't hate Jesus, but their fear of people is big enough that they are very hesitant to embrace Jesus. There are some who are truly searching, and they're at least open to embracing Jesus if they could just be convinced of his truth. There are some who are convinced of the truth of Jesus and have already embraced him in his gospel. And there are probably a lot more responses that don't succinctly fit into these examples. But how does this help us in our following of Jesus today? It helps us to realize that we will likely face a lot of different responses as we share Jesus. I think it's good to go ahead and prepare ourselves to know that we are going to face disagreement over Jesus as we share him. That, that's, just, that's just the truth of the matter. Some may reject him. Some may simply consider him. Some may accept him. And some may have an entirely different response altogether. Ultimately, their response is not our responsibility. You know that, right? Someone else's response to the truth of who Jesus is is not your responsibility. But where our obedience lies is in sharing that truth of who Jesus is with those he's placed around us. I think it will help us to experience the eternal life that Jesus offers if we will go ahead and prepare ourselves to face disagreement as we share Jesus. Because I think a lot of times we don't prepare ourselves to face disagreement and then we're very deflated when that disagreement comes up. Just know that not everybody's going to accept Jesus. That's very sad. That's very sobering. But that's the truth. Prepare yourself that way. Notice the fourth imperative that helps us as we follow Christ is this. We need to learn to lean in to worship Jesus. Now, when I use that term, lean in, I'm just simply talking about intentionality. We need to intentionally choose to respond to the truth of who Jesus is by worshiping. I don't mean showing up on a Sunday and singing songs. I mean truly in your mind and in your heart on a daily basis, giving back to God the glory that he deserves by simply saying thank you or acknowledging who he is instead of drawing your own conclusions. Let's see what happens here, starting in verse 35. So Jesus heard that they had cast him out, talking about the blind man who's now healed. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. This man had reached the point of faith in his life where he now understood who Jesus was through Jesus' very words to him, and he chose to place his trust in Jesus as the Messiah, as God's plan to rescue him from sin. He became a believer in Christ by trusting in faith who Christ is. Can I stop right there and encourage you to do the same if you've never done so? I'm talking to a crowd of people here in this auditorium, a group of people in the basement, 
uh, watching by, li by feed, and I'm talking to people who are watching by live stream right now. I don't assume that every single one of those people know Christ as their Savior. And so if you don't know Christ as your Savior, I want to encourage you, even beg you, to choose to accept Christ for who he is. He is God. He is God's plan to remediate the problem of sin, and he is exclusively the answer for every single one of our sin problem, and he is to be accepted by faith as our one and only solution from God and Savior from sin. If you've never accepted that for yourself, I want to beg you to do that. You say, how do I do that? Well, really the Bible tells us how one can know Christ. It's very simple, and it's very easy to, to place one's faith in Christ. But I will, I'll, sit, I'll offer this. If when this service is over, you would like to talk about how it is that you can place your faith in Christ once and for all, I will make myself available. Or somebody else in this church would be glad to do so too in a one-on-one -on -one setting and open God's word and show you how you can become a child of God through faith in Christ alone. Don't put that off. This guy became a believer in Christ. You can too. But the other part of his response to finding out who Jesus was, was to worship him. This, when it says he worshiped him, this comes from a Greek word that is, is, is um, proskun, proskuneo. It's a compound word between the word pros and kuneo. Pros means toward, kuneo means to kiss. And so literally what it's saying here, the transliteration, or the, 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 it's translated from a word that means to kiss toward. I don't mean like blowing kisses. But this has the idea of giving obeisance to, giving reverence to, giving deference to, you know, looking to the one who is God. He recognized that Jesus was God's chosen one for bringing eternal life, and he bowed down to that, and he elevated Jesus appropriately as God himself. You see, when we recognize the fact that Jesus is God, our, and, and what he is offering, our appropriate response is worship. Again, it's not just singing songs on Sunday, but letting the worship of God characterize how we live every single moment. And you know what? I'll tell you this, including myself, we are not very good at this. You know why? For the same reason we're not good at a lot of things. We don't practice it. We're not in the habit of it. How many of us are truly in the habit of continual personal worship? I'm talking about a pattern of thinking and responding that acknowledges that Jesus is worth our every focus and pursuit. I'll tell you this, my pattern is often to let my own conclusions and my own thinking dictate my focus, but when we are in a spirit of worship, in a habit of worship, we'll let the truth of who God is, the truth of who Jesus is and what he's brought to us, we will let that dictate how we think and respond. When, like for instance, we're faced with something hard or something that is perplexing, when we are in a continual attitude of worship, automatically we won't say, well, I think it's because of this. We'll say, no, God is this, so I'm going to trust him. God is in control. God is good. God is, you see, every single one of us has faced even something difficult to process in our minds this week, right? whether emotionally, spiritually, or even physically. What we do with that issue hinges directly upon whether we've been worshiping and we're in a habit of worship or whether we have been in the habit of listening to ourselves and our own thinking. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying here, but what I'm trying to communicate to you is that when we are in the habit of worshiping, it completely transforms how we respond to the issues of life. It really does. And when we're not in the habit of worshiping, we tend to wallow. The absence of worship produces a tendency to wallow. You know what wallow means, right? To lay down and roll around in it. Like a pig. A pig wallows in the mud. We tend to wallow around in 
the issues, the, 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 even the negative issues of life when we are not in a spirit and habit of worship. But you see, a habit of worship often causes us to say, I see the issues, but God's bigger than that. I see this tendency to be discouraged about X, Y, or Z, but God's bigger than that. Let me tell you, mind. Let me tell you, heart. God is my forgiver. God is my provider. God is the one whose grace is sufficient. God is the one who gives me mercy that is new every day. God is the one who justifies me. God is the one who is in control. God, God is, God is, God is. That is the answer to the issues of life that we wallow in. We don't have to wallow. We get to worship. Don't, don't, don't. I beg you, don't go down that road. And I beg you because I often go down that road and it is a miserable road. It truly is. And probably many of you know that misery too. It doesn't have to be. We see here that in every single moment we can respond in belief in who Jesus is instead of wallowing in the issues of life. God's plan for man is to worship him and to do otherwise is simply not God's will for you. It's not God's will for me. Notice the final imperative that we see here for enjoying eternal life now in this life. Let me encourage you as this passage encourages us. Live to share the hope of Jesus. Let's take a look at the end of this passage. It says in verse 39 and following, And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say we see, therefore your sin remaineth. Basically, Jesus points out that he has come to heal spiritual blindness by, by, by rescuing man from sin through faith in him. And the Pharisees take offense at this statement. You think we're blind also then? Huh? 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 I know we laugh at that, but really, this was a sad cynicism. Because what they were doing is they were rejecting the very thing that their soul needed. Their soul needed to recognize their own spiritual blindness. For when one recognizes their own spiritual blindness and that Jesus is the one that comes to place the mud on the eyes of the soul and remove that blindness, it is then that one receives forgiveness of sin. It is then that one receives eternal life and the very need for their sin-sick soul. To reject one's need for healing, the forgiveness of personal sin, is to reject God's offer of eternal life. And there are people all around us who are rejecting Jesus, and they are in the same category of these rejecting Pharisees. And just like it says that the Pharisees, their sin remains, there are people all around us whose sin remains. We talked last time about the utter devastation of one dying in their sins without forgiveness. That leads to a hopeless and eternally miserable separation from God in torment, in fire. The Bible calls it hell. So what does that do to you and me who are followers of Christ? It motivates us to share this hope with those who have yet to receive it. So as we take Jesus up on his offer of eternal life, even in this, uh, in this life, may we live to share the hope of Jesus with those around us. Listen, we don't have to do everything. You don't have to get the gospel to every single person. That's never been placed on your shoulders. But I do believe God wants us to do something. I do believe God wants us to respond in obedience and sharing his gospel with those he's placed around us in some way or another. So we've seen here five imperatives that help us to follow Christ. Learn to trust God, not your own conclusions. Love to tell your story of Jesus' interaction. Look to face disagreement over Jesus. Lean in to worship Jesus and live to share the hope of Jesus. If you need to accept Christ today, 
I hope you'll let us help you with that. If you know Christ already, I hope you will choose at least one of these imperatives and let its reminder do something in your own heart that prompts your action. Would you do that? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this passage where we get to see more of what it looks like to experience the eternal life that Jesus offers. Lord, we often forfeit these aspects of eternal life because we look to our own conclusions, we look to our own tendencies, we let other things come in and cloud out these privileges. But Lord, help us to intentionally focus and meditate on these aspects of eternal life, even the rest of this day and this week. Lord, I do pray that if there is one or even more than one, who is here, who can hear my voice today, who has never accepted Christ, I pray that they would let us open your word and show them how they too can know this Jesus as their Savior. Lord, I pray that as we close out this service, that you would, you just help us to be in a spirit of meditation and to respond with worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.